One of the most evil men of the Second World War was the Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess. Hess was in charge of the largest concentration camp inside of the Third Reich, and he was a man who would pride himself on the fact he oversaw the deaths of over one million people inside the camp. He expanded on a huge basis. But it was inside of his own camp that after a war crimes trial, Hers was condemned and executed. He was taken out to his execution on the 16th of April 1947 on a specially built gallows to administer justice to the man who had committed such crimes against so many people. Hers was a man who would brag about Auschwitz and what he believed he managed to achieve there, but he was also a man who would return home to his family and children almost as if he had a normal day at work. However, what isn't as well known is what happened to his remains after his death. There were accounts after the war of a number of executed SS war criminals, such as Irma Grazer and Josef Kramer, being buried in the prison yard, where they were executed, but they were then exhumed. But what is the story of the missing remains of the Commandant of Auschwitz? Join us today as we find out, and remember to support our channel. Please make sure to subscribe. Rudolf Hurst was sent initially to Auschwitz to establish a concentration camp, and he then commanded the camp for over three and a half years, turning it from a small modest site into a huge death camp, in which over one million people would be killed within the barbed wire fences. Inside his camp were terrifying torture blocks such as Block 11, where inmates were tortured on a daily basis, and also there were structures such as a death wall, which formed a firing range where thousands were killed. It was a site which expanded to a huge colossal extent with the implementation of the final solution and Hearst was the one who began to trial and test the best ways of killing large amounts of prisoners on a daily basis. It was he who brought in the gas chambers and the crematoria to the site. He later went on to claim that, technically it wasn't so hard, it would not have been hard to exterminate even greater numbers. The killing itself took the least time. You could dispose of 2,000 heads in half an hour, but it was the burning that took all the time. The killing was easy. You didn't even need guards to drive them into the chambers. They just went in expecting to take showers, and instead of water, we turned on poison gas. The whole thing went very quickly. He was later sacked as the Commandant of Auschwitz, as it was believed he had an affair with a political prisoner of the camp, who then became pregnant. This woman was then imprisoned in the standing cells, and Hearst would lose command of Auschwitz, it's believed, for this. However, he would later return in May 1944, as he supervised Operation Hearst, in which 430,000 Hungarian Jews were killed in 56 murderous days at the camp. Hearst's Auschwitz could not keep up with the killing capacity, and because of this, thousands of bodies were being burned in open pits around Auschwitz. Around 10,000 people a day were being gassed, and mass execution pits were established to work alongside the chambers, with firing squads also being used. However, in the final days of the war, after working at Ravensbrück for a brief time, Rudolf Hurst sought to hide out as Franz Lang, posing as a gardener in Gotteruppel. His family were arrested, but he avoided arrest for almost a year. He was later captured following his wife's confession and was beaten badly by the British guards who seized him. They battered the former commandant with axe handles, and the captain in control then decided to tell his men to stand down. He later recalled his treatment, saying, During the first interrogation they beat me to obtain evidence. I do not know what was in the transcript or what I said, even though I signed it, because they gave me liquor and beat me with a whip. It was too much even for me to bear. The whip was my own. By chance it found its way into my wife's luggage. My horse had hardly ever been touched by it, much less the prisoners. Somehow one of the interrogators probably thought I'd used it to constantly whip the prisoners. After a few days I was taken to Minden on the Weser River, which was the main interrogation centre in the British zone. There they treated me even more roughly, especially the first British prosecutor, who was a major. The conditions in jail reflected the attitude of the first prosecutor. Compared to where I'd been before, as in imprisonment with the International Military Tribunal, that was like staying in a health spa. But despite being captured, Rudolf Hurst was called to the Nuremberg trials, not as a defendant but as a witness. 
He was a defence witness for Ernst Kautenbrunner. During his time at the trial, he said, I commanded Auschwitz until the 1st of December 1943, and estimate that at least 2.5 million victims were executed and exterminated there by gassing and burning, and at least another half a million succumbed to starvation and disease, making a total of around 3 million dead. This figure represents about 70 to 80% of all persons sent to Auschwitz as prisoners, the remainder having been selected and used for slave labour in the concentration camp industries. Including amongst the executed and burned were approximately 20,000 Russian prisoners of war, who were delivered to Auschwitz in Wehrmacht transports operated by regular Wehrmacht officers and men. The remainder of the total number of victims included around 100,000 German Jews and a great number of citizens from the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Greece or other countries. We executed around 400,000 Hungarian Jews alone at Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. He later changed his estimated death toll and said, I myself never knew the total number and I have had nothing to help me arrive at the estimate. I can only remember the figures involved in the larger actions which were repeated to me by Eichmann or his deputies. From Upper Silesia and the general government, 250,000. Germany and Versailles-Stadt, 100,000. Holland, 95,000. Belgium, 20,000. France, 110,000. Greece, 65,000. Hungary, 400,000. Slovakia, 90,000. I can no longer remember the figures for the smaller actions, but they were insignificant by comparisons with these numbers given above. I regard a total number of 2.5 million as far too high. Even Auschwitz had limits to its destructive capabilities. However, Rudolf Hurst was then placed on trial himself. He was sentenced to death for his crimes, and then former prisoners of Auschwitz petitioned to the court to allow that his execution should take place inside of the former camp that he oversaw. This was allowed, and a specially built gallows was made for his execution. Four days before his execution, he realised what he had done and he wrote, My conscience compels me to make the following declaration. In the solitude of my prison cell, I have come to the bitter recognition that I have sinned gravely against humanity. As Commandant of Auschwitz, I was responsible for carrying out part of the cruel plans of the Third Reich for human destruction. In so doing, I have inflicted terrible wounds on humanity. I caused unspeakable suffering for the Polish people in particular. I am to pay for this with my life. May the Lord God forgive one day what I have done. I ask the Polish people for forgiveness. In Polish prisons I experienced for the first time what human kindness is. Despite all that has happened, I have experienced humane treatment which I could never have expected and which has deeply shamed me. May the facts which are now coming out about the horrible crimes against humanity make the repetition of such cruel acts impossible for all time. So he had realised the magnitude of his crimes and he shortly before his execution returned to the Catholic Church. He was given the sacrament of penance and was then administered Holy Communion before he had a date with the executioner. In a farewell letter to his wife he wrote, Based on my present knowledge, I can see today clearly, severely and bitterly for me, that the entire ideology about the world, in which I believe so firmly and unswervingly, was based on complete wrong premises, and had to absolutely collapse one day. And so my actions in the service of this ideology were completely wrong, even though I faithfully believed the idea was correct. Now it was very logical that strong doubts grew within me, and whether my turning away from my belief in God was based on completely wrong premises. It was a hard struggle, but I have again found my faith in God. He also wrote to his eldest son, saying, Keep your good heart. Become a person who lets himself be guided primarily by warmth and humanity. Learn to think and judge for yourself responsibly. Don't accept everything without criticism, and it's absolutely true. The biggest mistake of my life was that I believed everything faithfully, which came from the top and I didn't dare have the least bit of doubt about the truth of which was presented to me. In all your undertakings, don't let your mind speak, but listen above all to the voice in your heart. German prisoners of war had made the gallows with a trapdoor to hang Rudolf Hearst, and they finished the job at dawn that day. 
On the 16th of April 1947, the 45-year-old Rudolf Hess would be transferred to Auschwitz. His execution had actually been delayed, as he was worried that Polish people would seize him and then lynch him. But he was then taken into Auschwitz at 8am, and he was taken to the building which housed his office. He asked for a cup of coffee, and after he had finished, he was taken into a cell in Block 11, the death block of the camp. At 10 o'clock he was led out to his execution. He strolled calmly and confidently throughout the camp he once oversaw, and he walked to the gallows. His arms had been secured and restrained behind his back, and the executioners, two of whom wore a black mask, helped him up the stairs of the gallows and onto a stool which had been placed above the trap door and below the wooden gallows structure. A priest, Father Zaremba, walked towards Hearst, who was stood on the stool, and then the prosecutor then read out the death sentence. The executioner placed a noose around Rudolf Hearst's neck, and it was then adjusted by Hearst with a movement of his head. Following this, the hangman then pulled out the stool from Hearst, and he crashed through the trap door, and his body hit the door when it opened. The execution took place at 10.08am, and by 10.21am, he had been declared dead. However, what happened to the remains of Rudolf Hearst after this? As mentioned, there were many former executed Nazi guards whose remains were buried and interred in specific places. Those SS guards who were executed at Hamlin Prison, including Irma Grazer, Johanna Bormann, Elizabeth Volkenrath, Josef Kramer, the Beast of Belsen, a close friend of Hearst, were actually buried and not cremated. These were interred inside of coffins which were then buried inside of a courtyard a stone's throw from the execution chamber where they died at Hamlin Prison. But many other SS guards were cremated, and it's not entirely known what happened to Rudolf Hearst's remains after his death. This is due to the fact there was a reporting blackout of his execution, and newspapers were forbidden in Poland to print statements from those who witnessed his death. But it was considered that Rudolf Hearst's body was cut down from the gallows in Auschwitz, and he was then placed inside of a coffin which had been placed next or near to the gallows. There were many people who saw what happened that day, but little was known about what happened after this. His remains were, it's then believed, taken away, and could very easily have been taken further into Auschwitz, and specifically into Auschwitz's crematorium 1, which was very close and next to the gallows where he was executed. This crematorium would have dealt with the remains of thousands during Auschwitz's time in operation. It's believed that Rudolf Hearst's remains were then probably burned inside one of the crematoriums in Auschwitz, which was in a sense justice. There would be the same ovens that he sent thousands of people to after their deaths, and he would be the final person cremated in the camp where he oversaw such horror. But after the cremation of the Commandant of Auschwitz, what happened to the ashes or remains? It's unlikely they would have been given to his wife, and she would later start a new life for herself inside of America. The remains of high-ranking Nazis or SS guards were often scattered in nearby rivers, so that in the future they would not become relics or be worshipped by Nazi groups. However, it's been claimed that Rudolf Hearst's ashes were actually scattered very close to the camp. It's believed that his ashes were scattered shortly after his cremation in the Auschwitz forest, somewhere that surrounded the camp. This was to prevent them becoming a relic and then being venerated. However, this, as mentioned, is not concrete, and there are very little pieces of evidence available as to completely say what happened to Rudolf Hearst's remains. It's unlikely he would have been buried, as there would have been a danger that his grave would have become a site of pilgrimage, like Rudolf Hess's grave would later become. But Rudolf Hearst was the commandant of Auschwitz, who met his end inside of the very concentration camp that he oversaw. He was a brutal man who had very little regard for the prisoners that he held captive, and he was a man who employed SS guards to display and exhibit immense brutality. He would brag at the Nuremberg trials about his deadly escapades and how evil and huge the killing process was at the camp, but his remains were allegedly cremated and were then scattered nearby, the very place that he oversaw. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.